Hello, my name is Francis Cody and I'm an associate professor in anthropology as well as being the director of the Dr. David Chu Program in Contemporary Asian Studies. Welcome to this event. We've organized this to engage with this exciting uh, project on the lives of data, where we'll be discussing the volume by that title, edited by Sandeep Mertia, and published open access by the Institute of Network Cultures Theory on Demand series. Before starting, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This event is the second in a new series on the political life of information, which brings together scholars, activists, artists, and other practitioners to reflect on practices of surveillance, data visualization, population management, identification, news and journalism, and the social aspects of algorithms from a perspective based in Asia, but speaking to a broad audience interested in the political ramifications of media and information technology. And this is sponsored by the Asian Institute. And if there's a great deal of overlap between how I framed the series and the arguments behind this wonderful volume we'll be discussing today, it's in part because of a shared source in thinking in the Sarai Project at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, uh, Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi, where workshops that led to this volume took place and where we held a smaller workshop jointly organized with the University of Toronto about a year and a half ago, which Sandeep also participated in. I think Sandeep might speak a little bit more about how the book came about. So here I'll simply continue with just a few opening remarks to get us started. Citing Yokui, Lily Irani, Kavita Philip, and Paul Dorish, Sandeep writes in his introduction, and I'll quote, critical is wider research into a variety of sites to unsettle standard utopian and dystopian narratives of a developmentalist parochialism centered on Europe and North America, end quote. I think he captures what many of us are trying to do, especially in this series on the political life of information. The consistency with which both utopian and dystopian visions generated from a provincial North American or European perspective have guided our research must not only become an object of our research, I think post-colonial studies did that rather effectively, but a younger set of scholars are now committed to the generation of concepts and even normative claims that either explicitly or sometimes tacitly assume what is often called the global South as the context from which to tell general narratives about society and technology. Asian responses to the COVID pandemic offer an opportunity perhaps to open this field further. When reading in this volume, for example, about a quote, purported commensurability between data imaginaries and practices of India's welfare state and those of big technologies companies that widens the scope of inquiry into the politics of data-driven governance and bureaucracy, I cannot help but think about the transformations in citizenship that we see accelerating over the last year. Claims on the state have never been more deeply mediated by information technology. When Anumeha Yadav's contribution to the volume investigates the ratification of rights, for instance, we revisit a question first posed by Hannah Arendt in a radically new milieu. For Arendt, remember, the paradox of citizenship is that universal human rights could should belong to all, but could only be guaranteed by particular nation states, generating her memorable formulation of citizenship as, quote, the right to have rights. More recently, in a thought-provoking article published in The Wire by Arjuna Padre, who also happens to be Sandeep's supervisor in his PhD project, he discusses the material dimensions of what I see to be the Arendtian problem and his focus on bureaucratic documentation as the sole and overriding criterion of citizenship. The right to have right, the right to have rights rather, here relies on particular media. In Apadre's vision, what he calls not the citizen, but the statism is one who belongs because they have been granted a state certified document. All his or her rights flow from this fact alone, according to Apadre. We might say that the document here in his concept of statesmanship 
works as a sort of right to the right to have rights. He was concerned with the prospect of an all India national register of citizens, where one could only prove one's belonging to the state through paper documents that had already been certified by that very state. But what are digital documentation, which is where we're quickly headed? In an Apadrayan spirit, I'll ask you to please forgive me for introducing another twist to this problematic in the figure of the datizen, whose right to the right to have rights is now located in the digital traces they can mobilize to justify their claims. I think this is a key figure emerging in India and elsewhere, but one who is emerging in differently configured media environments. Now, one version of the story of datizenship might tell us of a delusion individualization of the subject of rights and increasingly abstract forms of control across data platforms. But the story and the lives of data point in a somewhat different direction. I'm thinking, for example, of the chapter in this volume by Priti Mudliar, who investigates the biometric authentication failures in the use of the universal ID card named Adar, based on ethnographic research in Ajmer district in Rajasthan. Quoting, uh, sorry, documenting the experiences of people denied access to food supply because of other authentication failures. Mudliar shows how the burden of repair is put on the bodies of excluded citizens as they become what she calls broken data in the big data system of Adar. The excluded are urged to understand this to be a failure of their bodies to match with the stored biometric data. I'm quoting here from Sandeep's introduction. Now, the anthropologist Vijenka Nayar has collected similar stories about Adar where a farmer's lack of defining fingerprints, a result of intense labor over the course of a lifetime, interferes with their digital recording and their capacity to make claims. And the broader point about technological mediation of citizenship is brought home even more forcefully and tragically, one might say, in stories emerging from the prophylactic lockdowns during the early days of the pandemic. Here, the digital e pass one needed to be able to travel during the nationwide lockdown in India excluded large swaths of the migrant labor worker population, subject to corporal punishment from police, while Indian Air Force and Navy helicopters showered flower petals on the COVID heroes of the country. In China, a three-colored coding system located in people's cell phones determined one's capacity to use public transport, leading numerous laborers to be forced to walk across the country in an effort to return home during lockdown. A key point that emerges in this line of research is that the datacens' right to the right to have rights is not necessarily only state sanctioned, but subject to commercial technologies that have been yoked to the project of development and government. I'll quote from Sandeep's introduction again. It's the cultivation of relationalities of data, for instance, mapping populations onto biometric databases that can be linked with bank accounts that has emerged as a key feature of contemporary modes of governance and knowledge and value production. Now, when looking from the perspective of governance, we can find that older forms of ratification, identification, and even data collection do not disappear as they're being remediated, however. Akash Solanki, a PhD candidate here at the U of T, in his chapter, traces the back and forth in between various digital and paper versions of the PDF format of spreadsheets the filing and annotation practices of bureaucrats and mobile uh, camera pictures of files, WhatsApp from one office to another. He gives us a grounded view of the enduring role of the paper file in its circulation, now reconfigured not against, but in tandem with digital media. So we have new entanglement. This is the milieu of radically uneven distributions of digital capacity and the suspicions that arise in such a context that we find different articulations of across these fine chapters. I urge everyone to please download the book. It's uh, uh, available for free, and we have a link to it at the Asian Institute website. Spend some time with it as a glimpse into what I see as a global story emerging of emerging infrastructures of belonging and exclusion. So it's a global story told from India. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest and the editor of the book, Sandeep Mertia, a PhD candidate at the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication, an urban doctoral fellow at New York University. He's an ICT engineer training by, by training and a former research associate at the Sarai program at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi. So please join me in welcoming Sandeep, who'll be joining us from Jaipur. Good 
should I start? Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, um, thank you to the Asia Institute, uh, the McLuhan Center and the University of Toronto and all the panelists. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, virtually, but uh, it's an honor to, to be a part of this panel to discuss this book. Um, so in this uh, talk, I, uh, Frank has already uh, brilliantly contextualized what this uh, book is all about, uh, where it comes from, and, and how it tell, tries to tell a global story through India. Uh, I'll briefly just contextualize um, the project through which this book came about. And um, before uh, we decided to do this book in 2015, we started working on the Lives of Data project at Sarai. So uh, I graduated in 2014 uh, with BTEC and landed directly at Sarai. And uh, I must thank Ravi Sundram and Ravi Vasudevan for um, uh, helping me throughout this process and creating this project in the first place. So when we started, we were looking at something that feels very distant uh, from now, we're in 2021, uh, 1st January 2015, we were discussing in CSDS basement, uh, Ravi and me, that there is this shift seems uh, to be happening uh, around data, around big data, which we uh, both knew that comes from a uh, industry hype cycle sort of discourse uh, from the Gartner hype cycle discourse of what uh, big data revolution will be. 2015 is the time when uh, many of the key publications, uh, social science, social research publications on big data are also out. Uh, the Big Data and Society Journal, I believe, is, is pretty active by then. And we were wondering that, uh, what does that discourse really mean uh, when we are looking at an unprecedented expansion in the number of internet users in India, when we are looking at the state adopting new kinds of technologies and along with them developing new kinds of models of governance, which uh, till then we, we had no experience with and the state had no experience with. So all kinds of things that you can imagine that come when you try to reconfigure the idea of citizenship, of the welfare state, of rights, of identity uh, and through biometrics. So the Aadhaar project started in 2009 but really picked up uh, in 2014 onwards uh, when with the change in government. So at that time, uh, to look at what these changes might uh, be in the Indian context, how they might play out and how they might entangle with older practices was a very different process than what we might possibly do today if we were to start such a project from scratch. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing that within five, six years, one can say that uh, about just how drastically the landscape has changed. Uh, India still doesn't have more, the broadband internet connectivity is still less, uh, less than 25% households have it, but the mobile internet user base is now more than 550 million or so, right? Uh, the technology startup ecosystem is, uh, after US and China, it's the third largest and has the maximum number of unicorns after these two nations. So uh, there, there seems to be a certain kind of acceleration of what felt in early 2010s, 2013, 14, 15, some, some sort of uh, a set of potentialities of what these technologies might mean. And of course, uh, with COVID, they, they take a very different kind of flight and I'll, I'll soon get uh, to that part as well. So what I want to stress here is that in that 2015 moment, when I first started interviewing people in Delhi, in Bangalore, uh, people who were in data analytics startups, people at the Ministry of Statistics, people who were working in open data, people who were working on smart cities, uh, and uh, in academy as well, in computer science departments, at the IITs, uh, at other places, that how do you make sense of the, the shift that we're kind of seeing unfold uh, in front of us. And there were many different answers and there were many different approaches to 
uh, what this might mean for say a smart city project or what it might mean for a public health project or what it might mean for a government dashboard project. Yet the, the mainstream discourse around these technologies uh, which is dominated by the IT industry, which is dominated by uh, the, the tech entrepreneurial uh, uh, set of publications, the business publications and so on. Uh, there's a huge gap in what is actually happening on ground. And soon we saw that the failures of many of these technologies were again put in the category of developmental failures and technological failures that one is familiar with from the history of modernization. So uh, it was one of, uh, one of my interviews at the Ministry of Statistics where I learned something about how these uh, failures and new opportunities are being configured into that uh, growing teleology of modernization. And through that texture where a certain kind of history of statistics of post-colonial nation building, a certain kind of history of media infrastructure where paper dominated government work and it still does in many of the chapters show, uh, and a certain kind of history of urbanism and media consumption is being reconfigured through new devices, through new infrastructures in a highly uneven way. So how do you capture that, right? So uh, looking at that challenge uh, and when we organize the Lives of Data workshops at Sarai in 2017 and later in 2018 as well, the range of concerns that these debates uh, opened up was staggering. And, and uh, it's partly reflected in the range of chapters that we were able to assemble for the book, but overall in the workshop, the range was even wider in terms of where these, uh, the kind of political effects of these changes, the kind of uh, new business opportunities they were opening up and the kind of new actors they were bringing into the fold of governance of data analytics, people who weren't necessarily uh, would consider themselves working in tech were now reimagining their role uh, in, in this shift. So it is therefore that I uh, pick relationalities, I focus so closely on relationalities because uh, it is difficult to pinpoint to any one particular technology any one particular technique or a set of techniques or even a hype cycle for uh, that matter that can capture what was shifting or how it was shifting. And to connect the, the, the key challenge to connect the historical context with the contemporary expansion, with the contemporary sort of acceleration of these media technologies without falling into that trap of uh, presentism that uh, these technologies basically come into smartphones, uh, become popular 2013 onwards. So therefore starting the history of uh, digital mediation from there. So uh, basically bring the, the, the long trajectory of subject making uh, through state technologies, through, through from colonial fingerprinting, which was invented in, in uh, British India to connecting them with all kinds of apps and all kinds of information slogans that the state would come up with and uh, would immediately be adopted by hundreds of millions of people. So that scale opens up a challenge that was not really being um, uh, tackled or theorized elsewhere. Uh, and that, that still, it uh, remains a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge that Aadhaar from 2010 to now uh, has more than 1.2 billion uh, users uh, data in it. And that data isn't just your demographic data, which keeps leaking every now and then in here, the proliferation of how it becomes part of all kinds of different services of state and non-state actors, how it uh, energizes new kinds of um, entrepreneurial possibilities of what can be done with that data and what fragment of that data in which sector. To, to look at all these challenges, uh, relationality has become key to open up this space where you are not just focused on one particular kind of data technique or one particular kind of institution, but a wider set of uh, proliferation. And I'd like to read a, a small section from the introduction that touches upon this uh, choice that I have made in. So on page 14, uh, the biggest irony about big data is that it has little to do with data per se. Rather, it has a lot to do with classifications, connections, and patterns that can emerge or can be generated when large-scale, high-dimensional, real-time, and variably 
structured or unstructured data are matched up with other data. Individual Aadhaar card, credit card, internet history, or any other machine readable data in itself does not mean much. It has to be positioned within the relationalities and infrastructures that demonstrate, for example, the uniqueness of a fingerprint relative to the biometric data of 1.3 billion others, or the classifications of one online purchases in a cluster of other users who might be interested in buying a related product. While invasive collection and monetization of data might feel like the infrastructural norm today, this is not always the case. Uh, the online ticket booking website of the Indian Railways, IRCTC, which by the way is one of the most used web platforms in the world, moved to something called a distributed in-memory database, which is one of the many big data architectures in 2014. And they're still trying to find ways to mine and monetize its treasure trove of user data. Yeah. Thank God for certain kinds of mediocrities. Um, simply having large amounts of data does not afford analytics or in intelligence. However, some of the IRCTC data were leaked in 2016 and the data dump was sold in gray markets online as well as in compact disks. We, we still have them for 10 to 15,000 rupees. That's uh, around 250, $300. Intermediaries are key here from contractual content moderators of the most industrialized platforms to entrepreneurial data brokers who market government owned as well as private telecom and financial data. Intermediaries of various kinds populate, innovate, pause and punctuate data flows. Neither proliferation nor circulation of data follows in the universal law, architectural truth or definitive model of intelligence. How then do certain actors, epistemes, platforms and organizations emerge as dominant? There are important conceptual questions involved here about how computational cultures are deployed to shape the circulation of power, knowledge, and capital in the contemporary, including the constitution of a distinct territoriality. Many commentators, top businessmen, and government ministers have expressed concerns about data colonization by Western technology companies in India. In response so far, we have witnessed policies such as data localization and promotion of popular technological nationalism by companies such as Geo, which is owned by India's richest uh, man, um, Kesh Ambani, uh, which is rapidly monopolizing India's digital economy. We should be careful to not conflate the physical locations of data, that is server farms and network devices, with computational territories of extraction of value and accumulation of power wielded through data. The latter has become possible for companies such as Geo and Uber through assemblages of big data technologies such as Cisco's network automation platform or Apache's Kafka, which is a distributed stream platform among many, many others. In just a few years, these technologies of distributed computing have apparently helped businesses and nation states to engineer and optimize relationalities of data in the service of large scale centralization of capital and control. Any critical engagement with such developments demands a robust socio-technical understanding of data-driven knowledge production and circulation. And it is thus that the, the focus on socio-technical relationalities of data, uh, the possible ways in which data generates and is generated by the relations amongst objects, digital and analog. And uh, I should note here that the reason why I use the term computational cultures instead of say digital cultures is because it, uh, computational uh, cultures is, is a more specific term. It has its technical, socio-technical specificity. And as you would see in many of the chapters in the book, what you're seeing is not end-to-end -end digital connectivity. You're seeing all new kinds of entanglements as Frank also noted uh, in Akash's, Akash Solanke's brilliant chapter. You see that the most uh, uh, elegant solutions of what a dashboard might be and what it might provide, the services that one can get from a dashboard, are being complicated by all kinds of local practices. So how do you bring those local practices uh, into the conversation uh, in relation with the cutting edge technologies, right? Um, relations among the objects, people, collectives of users and non-users, because it's important to note here more than 600 million Indians are still not on the internet. And if you look at the active number of uh, monthly active users or so and so forth, it's just a number is way less uh, than even it's around, somewhere around 300 million and highest is for WhatsApp, right? Twitter has something like 15 million monthly active users. That's it in India. Um, what, what about the non-users? They're, they're still there. 
they're, they're future data banks of sorts. So how are techniques being developed, keeping them in mind? And phenomena, social and mathematical phenomena, are key to understanding the historical and emergent conditions of data-driven knowledge. Uh, this is the part that I want to read from the book. Um, so just to, just to stress that there is, there's a, there are various challenges in studying these shifts in any context specific manner and in their scale, it's historical uh, uh, complexity is related to colonialism and modernization and it's sociocultural diversity and inequality of all kinds of religion, caste, uh, gender and so on and the current political climate, which has really been very conducive for certain kinds of technological centralization in the last few years, complicates the pictures in ways that uh, we really need to think afresh. And many of the ideas of, uh, say, for example, STS or even media studies, media theory, or history of statistics where the state is at the center and so on, uh, feel a bit limited in, in trying to understand what is going on in quote unquote, the contemporary. Right? So it is, it, is from, uh, an appreciate, it is from understanding of that challenge that we try to assemble a wide range of different kinds of experts, not limiting it to uh, academics alone or scholars or researchers. There are various practitioners involved because practitioners were involved in our research projects at Sarai in general, but also in the book, it was really important for us to involve people and be in conversation with them uh, to know how these technologies can be developed in, in different kinds of ways. So if you shift the goal basically from just trying to develop a grounded critique of the grand claims of novelty or, or the social impact of new computational techniques, apps, devices, platforms, and so on, yes, that is doable. There, is, there's a, uh, there are various scholarly traditions that help us do that. But uh, what one might, uh, well, one might say we're also trying to do is to expand the conceptual horizon of what is socio-technically possible because it is there that there is more hope of thinking beyond the, uh, a tech imaginary that is not centered on US, US or Europe and so on and so forth and uh, the reverse is also happening many of the technologies of centralization that are being developed here uh, like Aadhaar are now being exported to different parts of Africa and Southeast Asia so the challenges are, are proliferating and very quickly. So this is the uh, broad intellectual milieu in which we tried to formulate the project and the book. And uh, very quickly, I'd like to go through the TOC uh, and just say a few sentences about each of the chapters if I have the time to do so. Uh, I forgot to thank INC in the beginning. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, thank you to the Institute of Network Cultures, Geet Lowink, and the whole team who, who produced this book really quickly and then uh, designed it so well. So the, the foreword by Ravi really sets the tone for the book and it places in the context of last 20 years of Sarai's research and last 25 years of what my call internet or digital history in India and how to uh, connect some of the older attempts uh, to now that are bifurcated in various disciplines of media studies, STS, information science, HCI, and so on, which weren't as formalized 20 years ago when Sarai started working on these things. So the first section, histories, uh, the first chapter by me is, uh, is a history of computational practices and history of computing in India's early uh, official statistics systems where uh, Prasanto Chandra Malanov is the founder of Indian Statistical Institute was setting up the infrastructures that, that work till date, although the value of official statistics and uh, where they are counted and how they're counted has changed in many ways. What we see uh, in 1950s and 60s in India, uh, an early post-colonial nation uh, at the cutting edge of sample survey techniques uh, develops uh, all, all the statistical infrastructure with very little computational infrastructure as, as it is understood in mainstream uh, view. But the first employer of the Indian Statistical Institute, first employee of Indian Statistical Institute in 1931 is a human computer. So how do practices evolve from 30s, 40s, 50s 
uh, is, is something that this chapter tries to capture by decentering computers as just some machines or tools that you can put in and crunch data with. The second chapter, Programming the Intermission, Intermission Big Data Software in Indian Cinema by Carl Mendonca, who's a PhD candidate at University of California, a filmmaker and an artist, uh, takes a software studies approach and looks at a major advertising company in, in 1980s in Bombay that used to uh, program the, the intermission literally in, in uh, movies, in theaters, and how they transformed their infrastructure to become a courier company uh, in a decade's time. So it's a wonderful uh, history of how infrastructures uh, follow different kinds of pathways. Um, the, the next section forms, uh, the first chapter is uh, uh, number, probability, and community. Shivakumar Arumugam, uh, who's an anthropologist, uh, takes a deep dive into the Duckwood Lewis Stern uh, data model, which if people from South Asia or, or the uh, Commonwealth would be familiar with, uh, wherever cricket is popular, uh, this is a rather infamous data model, which decides uh, which team wins in case of interruption due to uh, rain or something in a, in a cricket match. But regardless of the accuracy of the data model, the, the model does something. It orients communities and publics towards counterfactual futures. And Shira, uh, Shivakumar tells us how semiotically the model operates. The next section by uh, the next chapter by Ranjit Singh, who's a postdoctoral scholar at Data and Society, um, studies the imbrication or provides us a methodological maxim to look at infrastructures like Aadhaar, where basically, the relations through which a certain person is enrolled with are not the same when the person is trying to uh, use the uh, services of Aadhaar for a certain kind of welfare scheme or, or logging into a system or log connecting it with their mobile or bank account or something. So how do you study the imbrication of the moment of enrollment or at a later point when you're trying to use it for something else? The, the next chapter by P.P. Sneha looks at uh, humanities databases uh, of cinema and poetry and how the research practice completely changes because of these new kinds of uh, technologies that are uh, folded into the practice and they unsettle the object of research and how they do that. The next chapter, next section, political designs, uh, first chapter by Professor Lily Irani, who's an associate professor at uh, UC San Diego, uh, is on hackathons and is a comparative study of two different kinds of hackathons, one organized by a civil society group, another by uh, a private group backed by the World Bank, and what, how passions are channeled differently to create different kinds of imaginaries, prototypes, and uh, entrepreneurial citizenships, uh, as Lily's book also go, uh, Chasing Innovation also develops. Uh, the next chapter, which Frank also mentioned, Anumeya Yadav, who has done pioneering reporting on the Aadhaar project since its early inception in 2010 onwards in various remote and tribal regions of India, uh, traces, this, uh, traces these threads of how early failures were documented how the state responded and how the project has become the legal political nightmare it currently is. The next chapter by Preeti Mudliar, who's an ass assistant professor at IIIT Bangalore, looks at broken data and what happens when uh, biometric devices fail to recognize your identity, fail to ratify your rights, and how these people who lose their livelihoods because of lose access to food grains and so on, uh, respond how they understand uh, this failure as a failure of their bodies. This is something that this chapter gets into. The, the next act, section, practices, brings together data practitioners who are not otherwise part of academic conversation or scholarly debates on what big data is and what open data is and so on. But it was very important for us to uh, hear from them and understand their practices. The chapter nine, Outline India, is, is a data analytics startup based in Delhi and they work in social policy. And for us, they documented how introducing drones changes the visual imaginary of a survey site, how they do cognitive mapping and so on after introducing smartphone tablets uh, as, as a survey tool in sites because they recognize that the survey uh, technologies 
are not just neutral tools that uh, you can just replace paper-based form and uh, with tablets and expect the same result. What happens when you do that change is something that this chapter captures. The next uh, chapter is by Gunit Narula, who's a very active contributor to the open data community in India. And he has uh, captured his experience of working with the development sector. India has one of the biggest NGO sectors in the world and how they operate from uh, global philanthropy institutions to, to local village level NGOs, how, what kind of data they produce and why it is not as open as one would like. The next chapter is by Gaurav Godwani, who's the director of Civic Data Labs in India. And uh, the chapter gets into uh, budget documents and how they are prepared. Uh, in, they are put out at PDFs, which are not machine readable. So it's not really open data as long as it's not machine readable. So Gaurav wrote the algorithm, made these documents open and public. They were public, he made them open. and. Uh, he, he also wrote about it for us. The next sec section is uh, the ethnographic core of the book. It brings together three uh, hardcore ethnographies of data practices and communities. Chapter 12, Hisab Kitab in Big Data. Hisab Kitab uh, is a Hindi term, which means keeping balance and keeping notes, uh, double bookkeeping in a way. By Nupur Rawal, who's a postdoctoral uh, scholar at AI Now at NYU looks at gig economy workers, Uber drivers, who maintain their own personal diaries to make sense of the numbers that the apps throws at them, the depersonalized numbers that the app throws at them. The next chapter, as uh, Frank also mentioned, we have mentioned earlier, Akash Solanki, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, uh, is a brilliant ethnography of a state bureaucracy introducing uh, Excel sheets and dashboards in the functioning of a government department and what happens when everybody discovers new or innovates at their levels of clicking WhatsApp pictures of documents and then signing them and then uh, creating PDFs out of them, uh, what kind of entanglements uh, emerge through that. And the last chapter is by Anirudh Raghwan, who's an anthropologist, and he has looked at a disease surveillance program which uh, surprisingly has been very quiet in the last one year when it should have been very active, how contradictory data practices of one picking up online signals, something that the Google flu program in the very beginning tried to do. It was one of the glorious failures of big data, which nobody uh, discusses these days, uh, tries to pick up from online signals and second from community surveys and how the approach of uh, medical experts change based on the class background and the locality the neighborhood uh, in, in which part of the city it is located in. So if you look at some of the poorer neighborhoods in Delhi, their approach towards uh, accuracy of data and how much weight and veracity they need to uh, uh, interpret it with completely changes. So this is something that uh, Anirudh captures in this. Um, yeah, so this is what the book is all about and we hope it opens up uh, wider conversations uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have the, the good fortune to be blessed by uh, comments from some of our finest minds here in Toronto. Uh, Mariana Valverde is gonna go first, Sarah Sharma and Tong Lam, and I'll, I'll introduce them in turn as they start their, their comments. And the idea is that they um, will, will comment on, on the, uh, the book and the project and uh, we'll give uh, Sandeep a chance to, to respond to their comments, and then we will open it up for Q&A from the audience. And so I, I'm asking audience members to send questions um, in the, the Q&A function that should be appearing at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so now we're, we're gonna hear from uh, Mariana Valverde, who's a noted legal scholar, socio-legal scholar, and has worked on a wide range of topics uh, over the years, and um, most recently focused on, on smart city initiatives mainly here in Canada, but also including India. Her most recent book is the co-edited collection, Smart Cities in Canada, Digital Dreams, Corporate Designs. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mariana and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through the, the, the comments. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to Frank and the Asian Institute for organizing this. And uh, I look forward to more exchanges and you know to learning more. Um, 
Uh, so first, um, I think Sandeep and colleagues really need to be congratulated for pulling together studies that show us that it's really important for, for you know, people who are interested in the flows of powers and knowledges to include the flows of data within their studies, but without isolating data studies as a separate thing. I do think there's a risk, and I've seen this among some of the PhD students in my own department, there's the risk of seeing the study of data systems or, you know, sort of, um, you know, computational systems as something by itself that, that, that you can study as if it were separate. Um, but one thing that um, I've learned from, you know, several places, but one of the sort of literatures that I've learned a lot from is the anthropology of documents, which of course has been very important in South Asian studies. So the reason why I know a tiny bit about Indian bureaucracies and Pakistani bureaucracies is because I was interested in the anthropology of documents. And I think you see some of the methodology that was pioneered in that field used here in these studies of data. And so that I think makes them richer than some of the other studies, which are a bit too focused on um, data sort of as if it were a self-contained entity or field. Um, um, and as Frank mentioned in the introduction, I sort of came to know a little bit more about Indian data flows and urban governance because after I had been studying the smart city project that Google had foisted on Toronto, even though then they abandoned it, after they abandoned it, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to look at smart city projects elsewhere. And I sort of come to that as an urban governance and public private partnership scholar. Um, so I looked at smart cities in Latin America um, on which there's a very small literature uh, in part because there aren't national scale projects like the 100 smart cities mission in India. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, why don't I look at the smart cities mission in India? And I did that with excellent, excellent research assistance help from two students at the National Law School in, in Bangalore. So by working with them, I was able to sort of a little bit remedy the fact that I have never been to India and I don't actually know much about urban governance there. So I'm happy to send that paper, which will appear in the review of the National Law School, but I'm happy to send it to anybody who's interested. Um, I, I mean, I, I found the whole Smart Cities mission fascinating because it's clearly a neoliberal project to force municipalities and to some extent states um, into partnerships with transnational corporations, not just the tech um, you know, firms, but also transnational consultants, um, which is quite interesting because other places you don't see this sort of forcing um, you know, municipalities to do this. It's more, it's usually a more governmentality incentive based kind of approach where you get rewarded, but here they're being forced to do it. So it sort of struck me that there's this curious merger of the most classic seeing like a state gaze, but also this sort of neoliberal competition. And of course the discourse of innovation um, Anyway, so I found it quite fascinating and I hope that in the future, some people maybe who are attending this seminar will uh, uh, be in touch with me because I, I think studies on the ground on how the Smart Cities mission is going insofar as it's going, which is not very far. Um, studies on the ground would be absolutely fascinating. And there's a few by Iona Data and a couple of other scholars, but not, but you know, not a lot. Um, so I hope to see 
more studies of how, whether it's actual data or appeals to the idea of data and you know connectivity, because often we have the appeal more than the actual re, you know reality, and not just in India, you know Sandeep, but but you know certainly the Google project for Toronto was all about images and representations and ideals and um, you know desires and there wasn't very much reality to it ever um, but I, I hope to see more sort of fuller studies for instance the um, chapter on hackathons I thought was absolutely brilliant um, and I was quite interested because my daughter who's 25 spent a huge amount of volunteer time while she was in business school organizing hackathons and I sort of thought, well, she's supposed to be in business school, so why is she doing all this free labor for private companies, whether they're banks or whether they're tech, um, you know, companies? But she seemed to think that this was a good thing to do. Um, so I heard about these hackathons, uh, you know, taking place in Montreal. And so what, what I would really want to see, and, you know, it's possible that it exists in book form or you know, some other form is fuller studies because the ethnography of the Hakistan itself is fascinating. But I think we'd like to see in sort of Bruno Latour fashion, we'd like to see where did the laptops come from? Where's the supply chain for laptops, which is quite different from what goes on in the hackathon. And where did those people sort of come from who were doing the volunteer labor? And where do they go afterwards? Um, I mean, there's some hints about that, but I'd like to see a much fuller study. Um, so, I mean, I won't say anything about the, uh, the articles because I loved all of them um, with one exception, which is the one that requires a prior knowledge of the temporalities of cricket. And I'm sorry, but I'm from Barcelona. So there's one sport, one game I really know, and it's not cricket. So uh, that defeated me. Um, uh, but anyway, I really just want to say, you know, congratulations and keep going with these kinds of projects. And um, uh, I think in the same way that the anthropology of document studies that we've had have contributed a great deal, not just to our substantive knowledge of particular bureaucracies, but also to methodological innovations, which have been so important for you know, people all around the world. Like for instance, the British historian, Patrick Joyce couldn't have written his book on the 19th century British state if it hadn't been for the anthropology of document studies that had taken place mainly in the South Asian context. So I, I just wanna say, do more of this, expand it if you can, um, and you know, keep working on studies that show us how both actual big data, but also appeals or images of big data, the appeal of digital cultures as a sort of trope, what work that is doing um, in a way that integrates data flows and you know what goes on amongst computers, it integrates it with social, political and economic processes because it's never separate. So thank you very much. And I look forward to reading a lot more. Okay, thanks. Now we're gonna um, hear from Sarah Sharma, who's director of the McLuhan Center for Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto, also associate professor of media theory in the ICCIT program. Her research and writing uh, and teaching focuses on the relationship between technology, time and labor with specific focus on politics of gender and race. She's the author of In the Meantime, Temporality and Cultural Politics. Sarah's currently at work on a new book on technology and feminism, tentatively titled Broken Machine Feminism. Next year, Duke University Press will publish her co-edited uh, collection, Misunderstanding Media, a feminist medium is the message, is the massage, is it? Ah, yeah. It's the message. <laughs> um, <laughs> She, she has also uh, published articles in venues such as Cultural Studies, the Boston Review, 
Feminist Media Studies, the Canadian Journal of Communication, Communication and Critical Cultural Studies, and Transfers, Journal of Mobility Studies. Hi, everybody. I'm, um, first of all, it's been a, quite an experience. I've been living with your book for about 36 hours, and it's like a completely immersive experience. Like, I finished my last day of teaching for the semester and then on to you. So <laughs> I want to thank you um, for this opportunity. And I really think of this um, and what I'm about to say as a celebration of what your book does for media studies. Um, I think it's been said, you know, many times that like data has no disciplinary home. Um, and, you know, your book definitely shows that, but I think a media theorist will get excited by your first line right away. I mean, you are one as well. And you say, data shadows our situation. Many believe it can determine our situation. And if there is ever a media theory line, it might be that one. So that's the first thing I want to say is that I, I'm really going to talk to you about like what jumped out at me in this way, because I think even when Frank set this up um, and was mentioning that you, this is a global story, that you have here. And for me, it's also like what happens when we don't let big tech or monotech set the terms for the global story. And um, so I really think your book accomplished this in such an amazing way. And I find like I'm always, I have disparate notes here because I have notes here and I have notes here. So I'll go all over the place. But I feel like I've been really making this push in my um, research and my teaching when I, when I talk to students about the work that they're doing. Um, about really getting outside of what Yuki calls monotech and like how so often the questions we ask of technology our critiques remain locked within a monotech monotech itself and I, I find it so frustrating and like maybe even like 10 years ago you would just see well look people are basically doing media studies research that lends itself over to marketing um, and now I don't know if it's just that so much but it's one that has like a tacit acceptance of big data um, that is locked in a discourse of big data. I don't even know what data means, to be honest, and <laughs> your book still didn't help me figure that out, but that's fine. Um, and so I want to wind us through a little bit of what you do here, which is accomplish this sort of media studies work that gets us out of that framework, which is why I'm begging you for part two, um, but we can discuss that at the end. And so, um, you begin by saying, you be, I have a few quotes that you have here. You say, technological objects have social lives. Um, not just that that, and or you say, not just that data is intertwined with the social and has social effects, but data has a social life. And I sort of got really, this is me paraphrasing you. I got so stuck on this idea of data having a social life that I started imagining like data as this entity that was out there in the world doing things. And that's how I started reading all the chapters. And that, um, so as you were like tracking it to get a better understanding of the emergent and computational cultures in India, I was thinking like, so this is almost like, what is the day in the life of data in India's informational present, a country of over a billion people, which has digital superpower dreams. You mentioned all the unicorns, um, but also pulled between enduring legacies of colonialism, but also the modern pushes to modernization, diverse and also unequal. And so what is the day in the life of data? And I'm asking you, I put it in this way, not to say like this is singular, because it's not singular. There are multiple data lives, but there is, and I think we can agree on this, and what I loved about your work is that there is a singular social technical imaginary that the multiple data lives recalibrate to. So it's not just like, it's not just that, I don't think we can just say, oh, data is multiple and intricate and complex. It's still, data has having a social life still recalibrates to this dominant techno imaginary. Um, and so I was thinking like your book captures what I would call like data's dance card in India. Um, and I had to have fun with this, like the elusive technology. Sometimes it's a current, sometimes it's code, sometimes it's um, paper, sometimes it's a fingertip, um, sometimes it's a data device, and other times it's a data discourse, which is actually like what you referred to as the dream economy is the most pervasive one. And so um, I love how you leave behind, like you can't call it, you can't call it an object, right? But in the same way, we need to sort of capture data as an object to be able to understand it. But still, you sort of leave your beloved object behind, let it recede into the background, and then you make visible these new tensions and patterns, new tempos, new forms of organization, um, cultural practices, but also really importantly, forms of resistance. Um, and these are the ones that tech companies never 
refer to when they talk about data. And I think this is also super important. And so the volume itself flees what I would say is a properly de datafied world. Um, and you find it elsewhere in the finger that won't scan. Um, and your authors do this with you um, in that, um, yeah, I was really a pretty model. There's a, a piece on the flower, um, the use of flower and lemon uh, juice to try and make the fingers scan better, for example, to pass the biometric machines, manual laborers carrying sachets of almond oil. And as uh, Yerav argues, the sources of their livelihood is what renders their figure, fingers hazy. And so as much as this is a book about social technical realities, which we know are never lived a singular, but there's still a pervasive dominant technologic here um, that, that orients the many intricate lives of data. I, I, I was thinking that what I'm left with in the end is why and why I'm asking you for part two um, is because in a sense, um, <laughs> I wanna ask like, what is the new technical social imaginary that we could actually bring about? What are the new possibilities for a different new governing techno social reality? So it isn't to say we don't need a governing techno social reality. Um, and I'm thinking about your piece work on monotech here. We do need one. And so where do we locate one? And you you also do a little bit of this. In fact, one of your provocations in the intro, and I'm going to quote you again, I hope that's not irritating, but it really spoke to me. You say, to rethink the status quo for a potentially decent, sustainable, and open-ended sociality, alterity, and generativity in computational cultures. We will need more creative ways to think of the lives of data and the growing world of things and being related to them. Meanwhile, relationality is abound. So that you leave us here with this provocation, and then I, I have to ask to some extent, technical social realities need to be devised. New ones need to be devised. New data lives are possible, and where could they emerge in this context, in this global story that you've told us? Um, is there possibly one on the horizon? And you didn't necessarily, I think a lot of your, um, I started thinking about the pieces that really spoke to me in this collection were the ones that sort of gestured towards that future, that other technical social reality that we could devise. And so um, there's hints and offerings all along the way. So I wanted to pull out a few of those. Um, in the essay by Lily Arani, which I also wanted to say to, um, we were just speaking about this, I guess, but I wanted to let Mariana know that Lily Arani has a whole book um, called Cultures of Innovation. Um, when you were saying you really wanted more, th there's more. <laughs> so that I hope that piques your interest. Um, but when, Lily Arini talks about this hint and this offering. Um, she calls it the passions provoked by open data, innovation and nation building can prove potent resources for experiments in statecraft, private sector research and the development of activist infrastructures. Um, so she points to hackathons potentially as vehicles of care, attracting people to the often invisible labor of protecting data, expanding access and sustaining resources. Um, so we have that gesturing to another possibility there. And again, to return power, like this is where I spent so much of my thinking. It's also the overlap and the broken machine thinking that I'm working with, but Preeti Modular's chapter, well, I'm gonna have to get in touch with them after this, um, on broken data. Uh, one of the things I loved here and how it speaks to your overall project is it doesn't just reveal something from the media margins. It's not like to say, oh, look at this media margin or look at this marginalized practice or look at these people that are marginalized by machines. Um, when she points out people are falling outside of capture, I mean, this is a real dominant discourse in American media studies, right? Like, what do we do about people that aren't picked up by these racialized technologies? Are we supposed to ask for the technologies to work better? Um, where do we, does the question of ethics comes um, after, like too late in this, and, but this isn't what she's doing, which what I love is, in a sense, she's pausing on the question and, and asking what it even means to be included in this monstrous scheme to begin with, and what does it mean to think of, like, what is the subjectivity that arises here, this data subjectivity, if we're going to use um, Frank's term of a datazen, the, there is a sort of data in that emerges here. And she asks, how do people, how do, how do begin, how do we begin to acknowledge people and their actions when databases tell them that they are broken data? Um, and so I want to think with her here and push this as more central to your book too, because um, these failures are not outside of the techno-social reality. You know, this popular quip we always have here, which is like, it's not a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's not a feature. I don't know, you know, the bug feature quip. This is something else. Um, 
this is instead pointing to the fact that the media margins are the very places in which we might begin to think about the new techno social realities. Again, in the part two of the book you're going to work on. <laughs> so, um, so in that way, then, I think it becomes really important not just to ask how something like colonial biopolitics or political arithmetic has played a role in the production already of people identity and nation states, but that there is a political arithmetic that is always and continuously pre-colonial even, as you know, to break, disregard, cast aside and abandon people. This is not a new technical reality. This is absolutely not new. Um, so I think that this idea of a political arithmetic has a longer history here that needs to be acknowledged as well. Um, and that our technologies that do the work of measuring always do the work of altering as well. Um, and so, yeah, I was thinking a lot about that when I got to that section. And I think also what I liked about this is when you talk about data having a social life and it winds through all of these chapters and these instances in these places, um, it's still weirdly not imagined, and I love that you do this, it's the media theorist in you, it's not imagined as an outside force to a body or a person. It, like it's not like something that's come into our lives. Um, so even when you isolate it to look at it, you don't leave it as like something that is outside. Um, and I think what happens is, you know, what is the popular narrative? Data is imagined as a motor, as an oil, as the oil, um, as a resource, as energy, as a bank when in fact it is absolutely secondary still to the labor and ingenuity of people. But also that th this people, again, if I can return to the broken data, the notion of people is broken data, um, resistant to normative repair. Um, this is where this ingenuity comes from and this is where the labor comes from. Um, and also the fact that so many, like even when you insisted like non-users still live in this computational culture. Um, and also in that way, as even as non-users, being resistant to normative forms of repair in this broken arena. And so going along still with this broken mending um, elements that we get towards the end, um, not the end, the middle. Um, so it's not just that we need more attention to Juga, but that we recognize mending and making still do unfold within and recalibrate to a dominant techno-social reality. Um, yeah, as you say, we're not going to get even, it's not going to be about novelty. It's not, novelty is not going to get us out of this quagmire. And so you have a, so when we insist upon and, and insist on cultivating a different techno-social reality, I love this rather ominous line from uh, Arumagam's work where he says, data models perform communities of feeling the future. And I was wondering, specifically for you, Sandeep, where is that feeling the future? Or where do you locate that feeling the future? Because you've mapped the contemporary. Um, and I want to know more about this feeling the future that's contained in the computational present. Um, what, is the, what is feeling the future of the fingertips? The broken machine is not the scanner, but the body, for example. What future does that personal ledger accounting book um, foreground uh, in the physical life of information? The ones, and also when Akash Solanki uh, refers to paper and Ravel in the ride sharing papers. Um, the personal account book is an intimate other, a tactical way of reshaping big data, which they argue sheds light on what user centric data practices may look like. And so then we can ask again with Lily or Amy, what data infrastructures can be made other? Which ones can be made other? It isn't, it isn't about doing away with our infrastructures, but how can it be made other? Um, and so rather than imagine the life of data gone rogue, what can we eliminate from data's dance card to keep up with my cheesy metaphor? Um, what, so while the techno imaginary is rather singular, but data lives are multiple, who is gonna devise, invest, and cultivate a new techno imaginary? And I really wanna know what you think there, because I know you have your eye there. Um, so that's a big question I have for you, which is a positive, like a, one in just simply in terms of being able to engage. But then I also, when it comes down to you talking at the end, responding to it, I have more, I guess, a logistical question, which is, I know what it's like to edit something and have all these people, and you always, you know, you're working with all these people, and I'm so curious, was there a topic or essay that got away? <laughs> and yeah, there, it's always painful. Like I have this edited book coming out and I look at what's happening. I love my table of contents, but I can't stop looking at the one that got away that didn't make it. I, could, I just look at the book and the first thing I think about is, oh, that piece got away. And so I'm curious um, as part of this global story that you pr provided here, what is the one that got away? 
So thank you. I've had a really lovely two days with you, by the way. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're gonna hear the last set of comments um, from uh, Tong Lam. He's an associate professor of history at the University of Toronto and a visual artist. Uh, Tong is the author of A Passion for Facts, Social Surveys and the Construction of the Chinese Nation State, 1900 and 1949. That's uh, from the University of California Press. And Abandoned Futures, A Journey to the Post-Human World, which is published by Carpet Bombing Culture. And the co-editor with uh, John Nifalke of the inaugural special issue of BJHS Themes, Science of Giants, China and India in the 20th century. His current research focuses on information, infrastructure, special zones and borders in socialist and post-socialist China. His ongoing research-based visual projects examine contemporary China's breakneck transformation, as well as the material evidence of Cold War mobilizations globally and their environmental and social consequences. He's exhibited his photographic and video works internationally, and I suggest you look him up online and see some of his photographs because they're, uh, they're uh, an important part of the broader research project um, in a different format. So I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Tong now for his comments, and then we can um, uh, have Sandeep maybe respond. And I encourage people to start, go ahead and send in questions uh, through the Q&A while this is happening. OK, thanks. Uh Frank and and uh, to include me in the panels. I've really uh, learned a lot. It's fascinating discussion so far. And of course, it's a, a, a big congratulations uh, to Sandeep and the other contributor to this volume. It's really a, a, a fantastic uh, intervention and very timely. And and uh, so I'm not going to you know go on and talk about those because you know that's a, 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 you know of course it is a very important uh, contribution and 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 at this very moment. Uh, uh, that you know that uh, so sort of speak to so many themes. So so when I look at the title "Lives of Data," I sort of right away I sort of thought of this sort of at the at least it sort of comes to me at two different level. One is sort of think about uh, a life of data, that data as things that are both material but also uh, non-materials, right? And and as a building block of information. That but there's a second layer of thinking about life of data is the human life that are embedded. It in the data and, and your book kind of address both. And I kind of like the idea that this really sort of thinking about this almost in the, what the uh, uh, urban planner or, 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 or even design and arts people talk about figure and ground, right? The foreground and background that, 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 you know, that it's no longer increasingly no longer clear whether which one is the foreground, which one is the, is the background, right? So that's sort of essentially sort of show that that human and data in this case, even though you know we are kind of back to the notion of data, as you know, as uh, uh, um, uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, that of course that, that it's, it's remained to be a very problematic uh, concept. But still, that that you know that it seems that our life sort of data become the conditions for life or governing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but also the vice versa, right? That that you know, so. So this is really a, a fascinating in that way. And, and I think I, I think I really like the fact that I think as already mentioned that this book doesn't take data for granted. So that you kind of approach it and, and actually look at different aspects of data, but also there's a, a historical dimension that you historicize it and contextualize to think about the history and key history, right, of data and computing, etc. Um, and also I actually love the idea of uh, including the petitioners. I, I think, you know, I, I'm, so, I'm so pleased to, to hear you to talk about the rationale behind this, because I think uh, uh, it's, you know, we, we all kind of so come so familiar with the, the, the idea of being the comfort zone of the ivory tower to talk about the critique and end this critique after critique, right? And the critique of the critiques. And 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 it is it requires really a, a lot of courage to, to reach out to the petitioner because first of all, this is really go beyond our comfort zone. Secondly, you know, how do you negotiate? I saw something I want to hear more about this also kind of ethical, political you know, that all kind of dimension that because I think, again, you know, we feel comfortable talking to one another uh, uh, within the academia because we kind of agree on many things. But what happened, the problem of that is often creating argument that is already predictable, right? We like an argument because we kind of, oh, we agree with it because I will probably say the same thing. Um, and even politically, especially, right? So I think that's the, the part that I, I find this uh, to, to 
to to to venture beyond the academia uh, 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 to talk to the petitioner, right? So that totally negotiate that kind of you know ethical political issues. But the fact is that um, the petitioners uh, of kinds, so you have journalists and, and bureaucrats and, and engineers who come from all dimensions, that they are the one you know that, you know uh, actually. Uh, produce and, and operate and, and know a lot of things that, that we couldn't necessarily know. And sometimes ethnography only gives you so much, uh, uh, right? So, and, 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 and that, that part, so I, I appreciate that, that, that uh, very much. And then I also like the fact that this book is, uh, well, first of all, done by a group of, you know, young scholars, and this is really emerging field. And I think that's, you know, so it's just, that itself is a huge congratulation at this stage of, uh, you know, particularly you in this career that you produce something that is so remarkable. But also, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that this is, again, I, I can see this as a courage. Uh, a lot of us may not even have is the, that the experimental nature of it because you know I think part of it is that that that, that is always a fear right you're putting something out there and and precisely because so many people are so interested in them and engaging the critique and the critique of critique uh, but but here uh, um, um, I think what is often missing is in fact the experimental nature of it because uh, especially in in a field that is rapidly evolving uh, that the, the entire landscape of the industry uh, you know, in every aspect of it is evolving, including the practitioner themselves, the designer, the engineer, a lot of times they don't really know what they were doing, right? They kind of know that they, uh, they think they probably will potentially reach somewhere, but that somewhere is still kind of open for them, right? Not to mention, you know, the same thing, uh, uh, bring, you know, come back to this idea, you know, say the Google smart city in Toronto that, you know, uh, uh, a lot of things that they, 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 they don't necessarily exactly know the end result, but they know that they, you know, they're capable of collecting certain things that could potentially lead to something that is valuable for them, right? So I think this is kind of, uh, and, and I think that experimental nature that, so so if they are willing to do it, I think it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, so it's important for us to, to be able to, to venture out. So I really uh, uh, appreciate that very much. Um, and, and the title of the book sort of remind me of two, two other, at least two other things that one, of course, you, uh, 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 right? Just, you know, the social life of things that, of course, that even though it's mostly talk about, you know, commodity values, right? So um, published much earlier. And then the uh, uh, volume that could have come to mind uh, right away was uh, uh, the edited volume by uh, Lauren Destin, uh, probably two decades ago called Biographies of Scientific Objects, right? That talk about sort of the uh, uh, the coming into being and, and the eventual potential disappearance of dif different kind of object of scientific investigation. But then those objects could be like idea of the self, mortality, you know, suicide, or, 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 it, or in some cases, it could be, you know, a physical object. But what you are getting into though here is you really talking about data, again, data is a bracket concept, but still the foundational, potentially the foundational building block of information, right? So you kind of, essentially in one way to sort of open up the, 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 the black box uh, um, and to get into the actual mechanics uh, the sort of P information process, right? And, and, and so that, that, again, that I think it goes to a level that's much deeper than some of the earlier works uh, uh, that we appreciate. And then you, when you get in the data, is that it's not taken for granted, but tier data is not something, uh, yes, it's abstract, but it, it's not all data, you know, uh, equals uh, that you did the volume so very well, the, the unevenness of data, the pack of what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, um, so some data, you know, so even though despite the fact that this is it's a call stand, and this call for standardization, but there's also, you know, that you show in different, uh, or at least the volume show in different respects that, you know, some data goes nowhere, right? They, they kind of dies off and some become very valuable. Uh, either for the purpose of governing or for kind of, you know, for, for, for the big tech, uh, for commercialization. And, and, and then also the first that, that, that is also theme where I think about big data, ideally that, that, you know, the capacity to bring in different structure and structured data of all short, uh, at some point, the, con the kind of the, you know, the quantitative aspect become qualitative, right? So, so really thinking about the life of data in the different uh, 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 layers and possibilities, right? And 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 then of course that the, the sort of from the 
uh, perspective of STS, one of the sort of the standard starting point of uh, what they were talking about would be thinking about, you know, how uh, in the context of the history information uh, or knowledge production, that how the reorganizing of information that kind of entail the reorganization and the remaking of the social world, right? So any other works of making things sort of legible, but it's not saying previously things were not legible. This is you know, sort of one of the things that I, I uh, in the past I worked on was sort of arguing precisely that it's really about shifting, shifting from one kind of legibility into a different kind of legibility that, that you know, so, so the logic is now seeing what's considered as, you know, valuable, useful is now no longer the same. And data seems to have that kind of, you know, making the similar kind of move that, so you're producing kind of new reality and new ontologies and, and new life, of course. Um, and, and so this sort of opened up a question that, you know, often people think about make, moving from one, you know, kinds of legibility into a different kind of legibility is often require some kind of conversions. In other words, sort of you know, persuade people to, to subscribe, buy into this kind of new logic, a new way of seeing. And, and my own work kind of think about a much earlier moment when, you know, but, but here I can see uh, uh, you, we are already increasingly living in a time that we are no longer uh, at least increasingly possible. I don't want to say impossible, but I think it's increasingly it difficult to live outside of this data world, right? We, but we can live along with that, or we have to live along with that instead, instead of simply living inside it. And I think that was a sort of sentiment that come out in a lot of the chapters. Uh, I like that the conversion, in, that, in, other words, in other words, the new legibility is not something that is self-evidence, it's not better. Right, and then you have chapters that talk about broken data, talk about the Uber driver hack today. That was fascinating. You had to create your own data log, right, to keep track of the data. It sort of remind me I, that I once upon a time I know uh, 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 someone who who need to you know basically you receive the credit card statement every month, and then you have to calculate it every another time, one more time, right? So the same kind of idea that because you don't trust that, so that it create a lot of anxiety. What we're getting into, right? It's not self evidently something is better or inherently, but let's say legible as if it's actually showing you something. But a lot of times it's whatever it's showing you, either it doesn't make sense or it just simply create a fear, anxiety and confusion or uncertainty. And I think some of this chapter really shows that, right? Uh, when it's broken that require intervention or, or simply that you don't trust it. Uh, or other times when you talk about PDF files that, that you know, it doesn't go anywhere, but, but you have to convert back to some other things. Um, so I think those are kind of fascinating that I sometimes think about big data uh, uh, um, in, in a good day. I, I, I kind of think of all his uh, uh, short story, uh, I think it's called on, on the exactity of science or in science, something like that. Uh, and, and, you know, when he would talk about the cartographer, the, you know, with the obsession of creating sort of accurate map, the map become larger and larger, and eventually the map become exactly the same size as the territory, right? Um, spectators almost sounds like this kind of desire. Uh, 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 and of course, it's a utopic fantasy. And, and he talked about eventually become a, a ruins, right? When it's actually broken. And, and I think that sort of, I think that perhaps is sort of sum up the sentiment of some of the, 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 the volume that, that because you so much driving into, in fact, is the moment of this thing that doesn't work. Uh, that that failed, and as I said, in a good day, I kind of think about that is what big data is about. And because I said this, I have many bad days. Um, that 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 that's always you know not necessarily as the devil's advocate, but that was just, I think we all have a certain level of fear that maybe at some point you know again you know can we still always live along with data or at some point that we have to become actually inside of that, right? So, so you know, uh, um, uh, Bernard Hardcore talk about exposure to society where, you know, we actually, the fear of missing out, uh, 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 that we, we sort of the desire to, to display ourselves, exhibit ourselves through social media and all that. So, so then I will sort of think about, uh, anyway, this is not a, 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 com it was a common sort of question, just to say, you know, uh, uh, this kind of project, despite that you have, 
successfully and, and effectively identify uh, many sites in which that, that we definitely shouldn't take this you know, idea that thinking about this sort of data have this is uh, ultimately uh, uh, can produce this utopic as it was envisioned by the uh, designer and the engineer, but at the same time, it, it also, it, you know, you often would open up possibility of changes or resistance or simply that the fact that it fail often provide the kind of possibility and hopes, right? But it's a bad day to say, well, is it, this is a transitional period that would they, uh, yeah, not to say that they would become perfect, but the, the space in which we've been outside, how much of that, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, would that be changing to the point that, you know, that, that does it make sense even to talk about the failure? Well, again, you know, maybe uh, just be provocative, and I, 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 you know, and I don't think I hope that's not happening. And, and but, but I think that was sort of something that uh, at least to keep in mind, given the fact that part of it is also quickly evolving. Phil, um, so but I have a few questions uh, because in the spirit of so many of our commentators, I mean, it, you know, earlier was asking for a volunteer, right? So I thought, well, if a volunteer, like what would be my, 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 my wish list for the, for the volunteer? Uh, so that, um, um, what, one, one thing I was kind of curious about is the question of uh, diaspora. Uh, um, that that uh, uh, this project, uh, that the way it's talking about, of course, it's talking about data in India, of India, about India, but it's also about India in data, right? So, so in, and of course, it's not talking about the territoriality of data, which you, you said is not really important, I agree with you, but uh, even though there are data sovereignty and all this concept out there, but but I was really thinking about, you know, what about being India in this case, uh, living outside? Uh, and then when you subjugate the multiple data regimes, what, what would be the, you know, how do we think about that kind of question in relation to uh, uh, the project here? It's so much is about, you know, uh, 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 um, being, living, engaging with the welfare state, the big tax, you know, and, and along with that, right, within, along with the, 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 the state and the big tech uh, within India. What, 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 is, what does it mean even, this is an open question, what does it mean even to think about uh, the diaspora who, who, who have, you know, uh, that, that you have a sort of open, open like potentially different kind of directions of thinking about, you know, um, other kind of data uh, regimes that they have subjugated to. Um, and, and I think a uh, 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 second thing I thought, uh, you already have some of the, uh, 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 engaging some of the issues about aesthetics and 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 you know such as like talking about drones and dashboards and I mean those kind of you know uh, potentially open questions about the aesthetics but I, I would love to see more because after all data data visualization is almost like data is one of the important part of uh, visual culture things that are not necessarily inherently visual are now you know taken for granted has to be visualized. Right. And, and so I think that that's something that I think still have a lot more space to, to investigate. And then the final question is really, uh, uh, and comments is really, uh, uh, um, a couple of years ago, I sort of collabed a project, I think Frank mentioned that uh, on, on sort of investigating the history of science and technology in China and India. One of the uh, 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 central uh, uh, objective here was not so much a comparative study, what we're trying to do was really using uh, 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 China to think about India and using India to think about China, right? So this is sort of, you know, in other words, is another way to think about South-South studies. Um, so if this is a global history, I, I wanted to see in the future project, perhaps it's even, you know, going beyond uh, uh, India and, and it could be inherent, quite uh, 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 um, uh, uh, valuable to think uh, about one side through the others. And, and one of the things that I, uh, uh, when I was going through this is in a way kind of wouldn't surprise me, but still surprised me uh, is, is besides what I said earlier, this is also, you know, data about India, but India in the data that, that uh, uh, naturally many of the author in one form or another draw to a certain kind of project, uh, like the biometric documentation ID project, right, for instance, um, that sort of remind me of the argument about, you know, state effects that, that even though, you know, the state is not everything here, but there is 
the kind of project that if you sort of move a bit beyond state effect and think about uh, the big tech that, that exists in this context, um, they kind of draw us into thinking about certain kinds of problematics. Um, so, so then in other words, this is the moment where perhaps it's meaningful for, at least for me to think about think about China fully in here, that uh, of course the first thing that come to mind would be you know, everybody was talking about it, you know, today, uh, the way it's kind of overstudy, even though no one actually know what they're talking about uh, or understand what's going on because this pack, pack of it is also uh, uh, colored by ideology, but pack of it was also, uh, the, 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 again, fast changing reality is the so-called social credit system. Um, and almost like people jump on it, it's always talk about, you know, the, the big brother, blah, blah, blah. And of course, it's, first of all, it's not big brother because that's so 1984, right? We're not 1984 anymore. Uh, but in any case, but, but people kind of jump on it and think about right away, think about authoritarianism and, you know, and, and, but even though it's a large part of it, it's about financialization of the everyday life. Right, and kind of liberal project that China and India actually have much in common in that respect, despite many of the differences. But then, when the biometric project that that people in, in the context of this one for instance, when people get into it from that angle, they're really talking about rights, right? That uh, so it's almost a practically very really few people even invoking concept of rights and citizenship when they talk about China. Right. So I think that this is sort of interesting that because it's sort of related to uh, some of my earlier projects thinking about, you know, the, the, the kind of, the, the, you know, so-called state effect that, that is really not so much about the accuracy of the data or the usefulness of the data, but the, simply the very historical process of engaging this data, meaning living full this moment in time, in this case, right, everyday life, engaging with these issues, um, actually created new kind of subjectivities that, that we actually reproducing certain kind of structure, engaging it. So we either reproducing the welfare state, the notion of rights and a certain kind of understanding of citizenship or producing some kind of, you know, um, whatever people mean of an state, etc. So I think that that was something that's useful to think about, you know, both to uh, the contrast, but also to think through it and see whether there are ways that using one contact to engage the other can open up new questions. But if not, then this is my question for you. If not, then is it because that in fact that the, the, the sometimes that we hitting a wall because it's, there are after all within each kind of structure, right? This, in this case, despite the similarity between China and India, I mean, when it was that, so after all, there are differences. And the state has a sort of, and, and big cooperation too, right? Creating kind of, you know, um, not just simply techno imagining, but also the physical manifestation that actually creating this roadblocks for you. So my question is for you specifically, is that what word did you encounter uh, any kind of roadblocks that the things that you want to have access or people that you want to get involved or, or questions that you want to ask that you couldn't do. Uh, uh, so as a way to, you know, given the fact that you already, you know, bring in a lot of all kinds of things, but I was wondering, my pack of it made me feel envy because the, I, I, I would have time, you know, I wouldn't have time to talk about, but that there are things that we definitely cannot do for people, you know, uh, doing say for instance China studies, you know, you can forget about it. You can't even, you know, get into the area. Not to mention to you can't even ask that question basically, right? Because then they would basically cut off, and you would never be have chance to interview them anymore. But so I'm wondering, what, what were there any things there that that you know? Um, it's not simply a matter of, of imagination, but it's really about you thought of it, you wanted to do it, you can't get to. Anyway, so that, that's my brief comment. Sorry, thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Tong, Sarah, and Marianne. I'm gonna now um, give Sandeep the floor to, to respond um, to these, and then we have a couple of questions lined up in, in the Q&A section that we can sort of move to after that. But I'll, I'll, I'll let Sandeep respond first. Thank you. Thank you so much for these rich questions and comments. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, by your engagement with the book and many of the things that uh, you're saying are, are, I'm realizing it now because so much of this book was written in 2017-18 and I've been uh, busy with my uh, PhD after that and uh, I'm realizing in hindsight, ah, okay, this is what we were thinking. Um, <laughs> um, or this uh, XYZ was the rationale for 
putting it putting certain things in a conceptual connection with x and not y and so on but uh, i'll i'll try to answer as many uh, aspects that that you raised and many of them are something that i just need to and not just me many of us who are involved in this uh, need to think more about uh, i'll start with the last one uh, the, the question of roadblocks uh, Okay, uh, I'll have to self-censor myself a little, but uh, in 2015, 16, India was um, less roadblocky than, than it is now. Uh, if I were doing this kind of work right now, I can immediately imagine 10 kinds of roadblocks of which database, which search engine, what will appear, uh, what will get traced to what, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but, there, there are definite uh, roadblocks in trying to address, and then different authors face this differently. And uh, I'm, I'm people who work most closely with the state, and I'm going to refer again to uh, my our friend Akash, uh, whose dissertation project also tackles with this challenge, uh, have a much better nuanced understanding of how this landscape is changing because something that the state started sort of doing as, as a pilot project in 2009 uh, is now part of its like central armory uh, of all kinds of things that is discovering the purposes as it goes along. So, and the people who are managing it have also changed. The ideological landscape in India has changed. I mean, uh, I was born in 91, so, but for me, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I mean, nobody ever, for me, it was, impossible to imagine the kind of India that one is seeing now. So um, um, that's that's the broad roadblock related concern. Uh, the the South South connection, China, India, and, and the diaspora connection. Yes, yes, definitely. These are, these are some things that uh, I very much on our mind when we were uh, trying to organize the workshop and there were other scholars from different parts of South Asia also in the workshop. Uh, when in 2017, but uh, somehow in the process of filtering out and stuff, uh, some of those connections didn't weren't developed, and there were also a roadblock related concern. There's there's a project, very interesting project, related project from Pakistan from a scholar uh, in the U.S. Academy who works in Pakistan, and they they really wanted to be part of the conversation, but they uh, realized that if they publish this uh, something. Uh, associated with an Indian uh, institute that might create fieldwork related issues for them. So there are all kinds of uh, such issues there, but this is something that we do hope to push uh, more towards. Uh, the question of aesthetics and data visualization, yes, that is uh, something that is uh, missing in this volume and, and part of the reason being, um, and it was there in the workshops. There were ideas around this. There were con even in our reading groups before the workshops and everything. Uh, I, I remember when we were reading Orit Halpern's beautiful data, uh, the discussion we had in, at Sarai, uh, it's like, imagine 10, 15 people from the entire spectrum of cinema studies, literature to social theory and, and SDS. Uh, and uh, I wish we, uh, we could have just written a collective chapter out of that from that discussion, but uh, there there haven't been many um, specific studies of this. They're, they're coming up, so if not in uh, an imagined part two, in somewhere else, these these uh, things will definitely come up because visualization is now thanks to another bandwagon of sorts that has come up in the last few years of mis slash disinformation studies. I mean, India is very big on this because we have the most efficient WhatsApp riots in the world. That is something that we have innovated upon in the last few years. So uh, visualization is a key part uh, of those technologies of uh, just extreme speech, riot making, and just day to day to keep, I mean, uh, it's more familiar with in the American context because there's more research on this there that how you need to constantly keep your uh, base uh, passionate about some things. So that aspect will definitely come up in, in studies that are going on now. Um, to talk about the, the transitional period and the Boris map, uh, which, which Tong referred, I'm, I'm sort of going uh, from the last question to, to the first one. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, 
Um, and whether we can continue to live alongside data uh, or we just gonna get in it. Um, I see two, two ways that we're not gonna get in. First, because the way these things develop and the contingencies that these things have, the people who want to suck us in, they move on to the next thing. Uh, <laughs> so for example, last year, uh, out of nowhere, uh, we still don't know who exactly created the contact tracing app for India's uh, COVID contact tracing functions. It was a, it's a government app, but made by volunteers from the industry, volunteers uh, whose names are not yet known. That app was being forced down the throat of everyone in the first few months of the pandemic. Here, uh, nobody talks about it now. Uh, that app and those volunteers were also used to create something called a Bharat Health Stack, which is an API's collection of application programming interfaces based on all the data that was being collected around contract tracing and the giants of healthcare, med tech industry and so on came together to make this set of APIs, which was gonna be the next big value uh, production thing. Um, six months down the line, nobody talks about it anymore. They, they couldn't find a way to monetize it yet. Uh, so there is something about how these things transform from within uh, and how they discover new goals. Then not to suggest that their new goal is more humane or sustainable or just in any way, but the, the shift, the speed of the shift does something that uh, we need to be more attentive of. And second is of course, uh, people who are realizing through these wider, what we call tech lash in, in the US context and in, in different ways, many ways in India as well, that the promissory, uh, the, the absolute promissory note that was attached with these technologies for all things, efficiency, development, connectivity, progress, and so on, has been put into question uh, through various ways. And there is a, a tiny uh, public out there now that is actively engaged within industries, within, within uh, what we understand as big tech, who are having these conversations, whether or not those conversations actually lead to something substantive or not, we don't know, but this is not something that was happening 10 years ago. That is something, I mean, I've, I went to an engineering college and, and uh, to even think of uh, something of uh, in these technologies in, in the context where I was, to even think about them critically was like, oh, uh, blasphemy. Um, but that, that landscape is beginning to change. Um, Okay, uh, if I may shift uh, and to um, Professor Sharma's uh, questions and comments, which again was very, very helpful. Um, the question about how can data, infra, what kinds of data and infra we can we make other, can we, how can we find their other? Um, that I believe I answered partially uh, when I was trying to answer the, the whole signs of hope that I see, but the way uh, this uh, sort of other is emerging, it's emerging in practices uh, and uh, practices and contingencies of everyday life of these technologies that are adopted in various different ways. And then their value registers uh, are also, because for example, the business models aren't quote unquote, what they say mature, right? Um, so there is a lot of experiment involved from the people who are trying to mainstream it, right? So if we are trying to not let it become the mainstream or try to find other alternatives out of it, uh, something that's going on in that experiment is of value to us as well. Uh, and in an ethnographic sense, and also in the sense of involving uh, practitioners uh, in them. and and how multiple lives of data get channeled into a so dominant socio-technical imaginary, that will, uh, I, I wish I could answer that. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, open question, but um, it's something that uh, can only be uh, answered when, if we dislodge some of the existing categories around which uh, socio-political dominance is imagined 
uh, for example, the state, which is which is such a central actor here, uh, is is a very different beast equipped with these kinds of uh, databases than it was what it was ten years ago, and so on. And the people it involves within it, the people it advertises itself with, the people who create its hashtags on social media, the people who uh, do its PR work in Davos and World Bank, and so on. Uh, that landscape uh, has some. Um, has some signals to what that dominant imaginary is and who, who, is, who has what kind of stakes in it, uh, especially since uh, the Reliance Geo, uh, the emergence of Reliance Geo and what's been going on uh, after the pandemic as well. Uh, I mean, this is kind of going into the territory of my uh, doctoral dissertation that's not directly related with the book, is that these, these feeling the future uh, who is invested in making you feel a certain way uh, is something that I have a better answer of uh, a couple of years down the line, but it is not limited to traditional state actors. It is not limited to traditional old money businesses, uh, nor is it something that um, um, the, 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 the social reproduction of that future, of, of the day in the life of data and the day in the life of the future are connected in, in ways that need further investigation. Um, okay, and I am maybe I'm, I'm a terrible note taker. So if I'm missing something, please do let me know. And then thanks to Professor uh, Mariana Valverde for your comments and for sharing your uh, uh, insights on the Smart Cities project. Uh, now, I, I did write something about Smart Cities uh, back in, 2015, 16, and it was the Delhi project. Um, but I, due to my uh, research interest and so on, didn't pay much attention to the special uh, policy vehicle provision in, in these smart cities, uh, which is something that I learned from your paper and was very helpful in understanding that how, well, we know that the state is reworking its contractual forms. The You can't contract uh, Oracle the same way that you can do a local biometric manufacturer uh, in, in a district. So these, these technologies, uh, legal and governmental technologies are changing from within. Uh, and uh, your, your comment on them was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, if, if I'm missing something in your comments, please do um, let me know. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, the, the credit for this being so interdisciplinary and not being formulaic and, and involving practitioners and so on does not go to me. It's just I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time and at an institution that uh, has done uh, critical social theory differently in non-formulaic ways for over 60 years now uh, at CSDS. So, uh, I mean, it was... If it were up to me, I might have uh, repeated the Gartner hype cycle of doing ICT4D in 2010, big data in 2015, AI in 2020, uh, and I don't know, maybe something else in 2025, but uh, it's, it's my, all the credit goes to my mentors who, who pushed me to follow these uh, things as they were happening in practices and involve others in conversation. Uh, some of the things that got away from this, we would have liked to have more practitioners, more uh, technologists as part of the conversation, but it is difficult. Uh, in parts of my fieldwork, I was also, there were legal threats also involved because companies don't want certain things to be written about them, even if it's anonymized and so on. So yeah, those limitations very well uh, uh, remain. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have some questions. We're, we're running out of time. So what I'm gonna do is, is group the questions. But the, the first one that was posed by uh, Ritu Birla, who's a, a history professor here at U of T, um, sort of builds perfectly on, I think a lot of the comments um, and, and, and your response. And it has to do precisely with the question of hype and speculation, which is something that she's also written about with respect to the changing forms of capitalism. So the question is, what can India show us about the relationship between the real real is in quotes here, uh, slash material exigencies and the hyperreal of the data simulacrum, if you even want to call it that. Because um, it seems to be one of the big themes that keeps coming up is the role of hype in sort of building uh, speculative bubbles that, that, that burst very quickly, but um, there, there's something happening with the hype. Um, 
what's sometimes been thought of in terms of charisma and so forth. So let's start with that question. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pose the second set of questions because as I said, we're running out of time. And, and so there's a second question from, uh, from Ritu Birla, and then it ties nicely to a set of questions that uh, Radhika Mongya sent, and she's at the York University. Um, uh, so the second question from Ritu is, I'm working on neoliberalism, finance, and mediation technologies. Any thoughts on the relationship between technologies of data collection, production, and new forms of value monetization? And that is something that uh, Radhika picks up on. Uh, when she asked, could Sandeep speak about how big data reconfigures notions of property and the extraction of surplus value? How can this be related to the entrenching social, economic, political inequalities in India and elsewhere? Also speaking of extraction, I'd love to hear about new forms of value that seem to be completely illusory, like Bitcoin. Uh, I've often heard that it needs to be mined. I greatly appreciate learning what is meant by this metaphor and how far we can stretch it. For instance, how does one locate a mine? Are these mines dangerous? What kind of labor does the mining involve? Precisely what is being mined? So I, I'll, I'll, set, I'll toss that out as a, kind of two sets of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, thank you, Professor Bilda, for your question. I was just, uh, in fact, a few days ago, reading, rereading stages of capital for, um, uh, to understand the history of uh, Marwadis who have become venture capitalists now. Uh, but um, to to answer to try and answer the the simul simulacrum part, uh, one uh, aspect of it is related to the interfaces that uh, certain kinds of interfaces have burst into social life that were simply not there ten years ago. Uh, from a few million smartphones to over five hundred million in less than seven six or seven years, right? So the production of uh, simulacrum, its material basis has changed dramatically. Uh, the, in, uh, for example, vernacular language uh, computing has been, efforts have been made for 20 years or more to create operating systems and interfaces and vernacular languages, but uh, they didn't quite succeed. But uh, as soon as uh, this, uh, after Web 2.0 companies realized that uh, the English speaking literate uh, user base in India is only this much. And if you have to cross that 50, 100 million mark, you have to uh, enable content creation in, in vernacular languages in visual forms, non-textual forms, right? So that media material terrain uh, through which real and hyper real and distribution of the sensible sort of happens uh, has completely changed. I mean, completely, is, is, is a, but has changed dramatically in the last uh, seven, eight years. And um, value production in it is still sort of uh, a dicey proposition because uh, many of these uh, businesses uh, run not by profit margins, they run by speculation and how much they can grow. So the projections of growth are still very, very high. You. Uh, the, India still is the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing and on many, uh, I think several of the last 10 years, the fastest growing digital economy as well. So the growth prospects are something that uh, operate uh, uh, in, a, in different language than what the individual user is doing or not doing, right? Uh, uh, Mukesh Amani can come in and, and completely capture the infrastructure of uh, 4G uh, of sorts, and create a near monopoly, uh, but the, the value proposition of it is very different from say how uh, these realities emerged in Silicon Valley or, or elsewhere. Um, and they don't even try to frame their business models. Uh, it's important to note that this, the language of these actors is very different. They uh, are aware that they are in a, the, they're leapfrogging basically. Uh, you're going from no emails directly to WhatsApp and YouTube. So they, I mean, they, they, these businesses do their own ethnographies and are very well aware of this uh, consumption uh, cultures. Mm. The, the second question um, related to surplus value. Um, I think to answer that one needs to first establish what is non-surplus value here? Um, because if, if 
you're just if it's a simple attention economy of the number of hours spent on apps uh, many of the value firms would simply not exist right so one of the formulaic uh, uh, things that came up a few years ago was this idea of attention economy that these apps trying to constantly hook you up to them using several hours a day and so on and so forth the monthly active use of many of these uh, platforms uh, is is very very little than what it is in uh, traditional Western countries, right? Uh, what the average user uh, does on many of these platforms. But still, surplus value uh, is there that, the idea of surplus value is still there. Now, how much uh, of it is just simply tied with the idea of that within five years, we'll have 500, more, uh, 500 million more users and so on and so forth is, uh, is difficult to answer in the present. There is there is a there is a value proposition in the present, but it can very quickly change to something else uh, as these things grow. the The mining part uh, and the Indian state, the current Indian state, does not really like things that it cannot regulate. Uh, so Bitcoin <laughs> does not have a very good future in India, uh, despite very high amount of lobbying involved. Uh, but blockchain as a technology is is here, and uh, mining there is something that various scholars have, have worked on. And uh, one of my uh, dissertation committee members, uh, Professor Finn Brunton, has has written a book on it called Digital Cash, which which is a wonderful uh, history of how all kinds of weird and crazy, uh, so, sorry, for, uh, I can't think of better terms, uh, characters came up with this idea of cryptocurrency and something that cannot be regulated by the state. There is um, Professor Anush Kapadia at IIT Bombay uh, who presented in one of the Lives of Data workshops and who uh, does uh, history and anthropology of money. And uh, he, uh, his work is, uh, provides a better answer uh, than I can uh, even attempt to, but it is tied with uh, questions of uh, data, databases and because most of these technologies are, are being pushed forward by similar groups of people um, who are at least sharing similar spaces of lobbying for the state or working with the state and so on and so forth. Uh, and similar sort of, uh, similar kinds of capital backing them. So there is that kind of social, social association, but uh, more intricacies uh, are there as well, yeah. Okay, yes, thank you so much, uh, Sandeep, for the book and for, for sharing your time with us to, to explore it further. And thank you to, uh, to Mariana, Sarah, and Tom for your, um, your comments. And thanks to everyone for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. And um, if you haven't, go download the book. It is available in physical form too, I believe, um, if you're not into reading uh, digital documents. Um, so please go out and read it, and um, we're looking forward to to the second volume of the book, which I guess now you have to he has to work on a dissertation first. But uh, but I'm sure there'll be uh, more more volumes of this sort coming out of of, of this collective enterprise that uh, Sarai has been a, an important node in uh, in fostering the environment of, of this type of research. Um, and so uh, looking forward to seeing everyone again online and in person at some point. Um, and thanks to the Asian Institute for, for supporting this and to Dasha especially for, for helping us. Um, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you later. Thank you again.